but uh, only to attend. And it's a thrill for me and a pleasure and an honor to have the privilege of speaking here. So I appreciate Pastor Parsons and Pastor George and the New England Bible Conference and your great ministry that you've had over many, many years. It's been a blessing for us in Ohio just to know about it. And several of our folks have come over uh, when they can. Over over 40 years ago, I fell in love with the book of Ruth when I read M.R. DeHaan's commentary, The Romance of Redemption. And as a very young Christian, learning to love the Lord and learning that He loved me, that book was just a blessing to me. And also the dispensational types that he mentioned there of Ruth, a type of the church, and uh, Naomi, a type of Israel. And I know some of the early dispensationalists had different views than that, but uh, that is my view, is Dahan's view. But I fell in love with the book at that time, and it's been a book that's been a blessing. So all of my five messages are going to come from the book of Ruth. And our studies in this conference harmonize well with uh, Pastor Matt Costello's studies. Uh, He's going to be talking about the second coming of Christ and looking forward to that and living in light of that. And the folks in the book of Ruth were saints living in light of the first coming of Christ. And uh, I think it's going to harmonize well. We'll see how that works. I'm assuming a solid knowledge of the book of Ruth by you folks and your churches and the pastors here that have preached through this book many times. I'm assuming a very solid knowledge of the book. So we're going to go fast and we're going to assume a knowledge of the book of Ruth and the biblical truths of uh, Leverite marriage and the, the redemption that undergird the book. But turn with me to Ruth chapter 1. The handout you gave, uh, I, that was given you, you only have to write on it once or twice a message, just one word in each of those. And uh, maybe one message will write one word, another message two or three, and then back to one or whatever. But uh, I believe in being practical. So it's when we move through the book of Ruth, we're going to look at what God's doing first, and then we're going to move down and see what we ought to be doing. And that that handout is to help remember what we should be doing. So let's uh, let's read Ruth chapter one and uh, quickly read it and get in our minds these old truths uh, from Bethlehem three thousand years ago. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Mahlon and Chilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came from the country of Moab and continued there. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. She was left and her two sons. And they took themselves wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah and the name of the other Ruth. And they dwelt there about ten years. And Malon and Chilion died also, both of them. And the woman was bereft of her two sons and her husband. Now our message today deals with dealing with the hard realities of life in light of living for the coming king. And this is the hard realities of life, right? Sin happens, death happens, and this was tough stuff. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, for she'd heard that the country of Moab, how the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on their way to return to the land of Judah, 60 miles minimum on that trip, uh, walking. 
And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you've dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. And they said to her, Surely we'll return with thee unto thy people. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters. Go your way. For I'm too old to have a husband. And if I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband and also tonight and should bear also sons, would you tarry for them till they're grown? Would you refrain from marrying? Nay, my daughters, for it grieves me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord is gone out against me. And they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, Behold, thy sister is gone back to her people and to her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, this is of course the most famous part of the book, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to turn away from following thee. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. And the Lord do so to me also, more also, if anything but death part thee and me. And she saw that she was steadfastly determined to go with her. Then she ceased speaking with her. So the two went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them. And they said, Is this Naomi? And she said to them, Call me not Naomi, that means pleasant, but call me Mara, which means bitter, for the Almighty had dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why then call ye me pleasant, seeing the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of the barley harvest. Let's look to the Lord in prayer this morning, this afternoon. Heavenly Father, as we wait upon you, may your blessing be on this conference. You've blessed conferences in the past with your presence and your working. May we know that working again in this conference in every message and every fellowship time. Thank you for those that have made the effort to come and let the Lord Jesus minister through his word and let the Spirit of God work. And so, Father, may it be a cleansing time, a sanctifying time. A time of strengthening, a time of comforting. May you accomplish what you want to accomplish. May you challenge us, we pray, with your truth. May you refresh us with your presence and greatness and your goodness. In Jesus' holy name, our Savior, we pray. Amen. Now, as you know, the main one to watch in the book of Ruth is God. God himself. And his providential movement in the ordinary affairs of ordinary people in ordinary places. That's the main thing in this book. And one old Bible teacher speaks about providence this way, and I love it. God's hand in the glove of history. That phrase has always caught my imagination. That providence is God's hand in the glove of history. When God does a miracle, he takes the glove off, right? And he intervenes directly. But God working in the events of our lives to to mightily undertake for us. Now, in the book of Ruth, and you look at the four chapters, in each chapter, someone, else, someone takes an initiative. In chapter 1, Elimelech takes the initiative, moves him to Moab. In chapter 2, Ruth takes the initiative and goes out and starts gleaning. She doesn't sit around and wait for a welfare check. And so, in chapter 3, Naomi takes the initiative and starts the romantic process going there. And in chapter 4, Boaz takes the initiative and accomplishes what he's promised to do. So in every chapter, someone's taking initiative. But behind it all and in it all is God who's working uh, through these people to will and to do His good pleasure to use the New Testament language. And the God of the Bible has His redemptive purposes in Jesus Christ. 
And we know that the Lord Jesus Christ is the theme of every book of the Bible. And God is using people in Bethlehem 3,000 years ago in a wonderful way, far beyond anything they knew in their lifetimes. And I'm persuaded He's using us as well, far beyond anything we know, as He's calling out a people for His name. And what a precious thing to watch this in Bethlehem. And I want to watch what God is doing. That's going to be our method. And then we'll see what we ought to be doing. Let's watch what God's doing. And let's go through the book in our minds. And I know you're familiar with it. In chapter 1, God brings distress to Naomi through Elimelech. In chapter 2... God brings deliverance to Naomi through Ruth. Chapter 3, God brings deliverance to Ruth and Naomi through Boaz. And chapter 4, God brings deliverance to Naomi through Obed. Have you ever thought about the book of Ruth that way? So... The same God who brings distress to Naomi in chapter 1 brings deliverance to Naomi in chapters 2, 3, and 4. I think this is important, and not every commentator sees this, but some do. Boaz is Ruth's Ruth's redeemer, but Obed becomes Naomi's redeemer. We'll see that in chapter 4. And little, Bo- little Obed is called a redeemer, a goel, in chapter 4. And I think that is extremely significant. Now, both Boaz and Obed are symbolic of Jesus Christ, who redeems the church and Israel. And God is the ultimate redeemer. And our title of our message is is Living for the Coming of the King When Facing the Realities of Life. And these realities are hard. I wish we had a time to really dig into chapter 1. We're just going to dip into chapter 1. But I want you to think about this, the hard realities of life and living for the Redeemer when life is hard. My wife had major surgery last February. It was a surprise to us for a particular problem. But she wrote when she told the church about it, she said, God has thrown me a curveball, but I know the picture, so I'm not afraid. Has God ever thrown you a curveball or a slider or a fastball? And you think, whoa. And it's important to see that the sovereign God of heaven was behind the troubles here in Naomi's family. But the same God that brought the distress brought the deliverance. Same God. And He had purposes in both of them. And uh, what distress it was, Naomi lost her husband and two sons. I think she's a female Job. Just like I believe Ruth is a female Abraham. And what difficulty it was. Now, there's a couple of things I want to say. This message, you're kind of preparing things. Obviously, Ruth is the most attractive person in the book. And she's the one our minds go to. And probably should as church people. Church age people. But the book of Ruth centers around Naomi. The plot does. It starts with Naomi. It ends with Naomi. And if we see that, I think it's going to help us in some ways that maybe we haven't thought about before. And the book and end book begins and ends with Naomi. And the book revolves around solving her problems. And in God resolving her problems resolves the nation's problems. And we know now we'll resolve the world's problems. You see, God can multitask. 
We think our problems are big, and they are to us, but God can deal with our problems and deal with the nation's problems and deal with all history's problems all in the same thing at the same time. And you have, when you see the book of Ruth, what's the first verse? In the days when the judges ruled. What were those days? There was no king in Israel. That was the main problem, right? Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. What's the last part of the book of Ruth? It ends with what? David. So the book of Ruth is dealing with national problems as well as family problems. And the leadership problems in Naomi's family, the bad leadership of her husband Elimelech, and then the vacuum of leadership when he was dead and the boys were dead, that's the family's problem. But the nation had a problem too. A leadership problem. No king. And the world has a problem. It's a leadership problem, right? If you don't think you have a leadership problem in the world, look at who's running for president in the United States. right? And so, obviously, we have severe leadership problems, right? So, I want you to think about the book that way. And at the end of the book, it's Naomi that has the baby in her arms. And the point of the book of Ruth is that God, who brought the distress on Naomi brings the deliverance to her and in doing that he is bringing the nation's problems at that time to resolution Um, early liberals used to say that the genealogy at the end of the book of Ruth was a later edition tacked on they don't even believe that now They even know better than that at this point. Someone said the breaking off of the the genealogy at the end of Ruth is like the breaking off of the tip of the arrow. The whole point of Ruth is that the king is coming. And God is bringing the king that needs to come. And he's working through the troubles of people and the life decisions of people to make that happen. One writer in a new commentary in 2012 that just came out said this, and I've seen this in about six commentaries in different language, but he said, The plot revolves around one major problem, namely that of Naomi's empty and bitter life. Everything else that happens in the book is tied to the development and resolution of that problem. And so the problems introduced in chapter 1 are resolved in chapter 4. Now, um, one more thing before we start and get to our practical part. There are pro-Naomi Bible teachers and there are negative Naomi Bible teachers. I've been both. (laughs) Maybe you have too. But I have become a pro-Naomi Bible teacher. I have a very positive view about her. I know she says some questionable things, but I've come to a position of of being a pro-Naomi person. Now, it's not something to start a new denomination over if if you have a different viewpoint on that. But um, there's good people on both sides, okay? But she was, Naomi was a victim of the poor decisions of her husband. And she may have gone along with those decisions. And later she understood that that was sinful. And that they were, the family was being corrected for it. But yeah, it was his decision. And it was her problem in not maybe bucking it as, as she should have maybe. All of us must live under human leadership that's flawed and sometimes sinful. And Naomi, and the results of that, and Naomi was like that. And Naomi's, after he died, and the uh, uh, the sons took wives, uh, and that wasn't Naomi's work. Some commentators say it was. It specifically says they took wives. That was unusual in that day, right? A lot different in chapter 3 when she's making an intervention. 
So, but she probably was compliant and proved to the move, move but uh, she wasn't sinless, but I believe she was normally a godly woman and someone that had an attractive life. And I have a handout on that in the back someplace. It's back there if you want to look at that. Now let's let's look at chapter one, and I want to just in, I just want to glean from the fields of Bethlehem two points this morning, a practical exhortation to us from uh, this chapter. If we're going to live for the coming King, if we're going to if, if we're going to ha- uh, live for Him in ways that will glorify Him and 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 the Lord, there's two great practices that I believe we see in this chapter. Number one, we must, and here's where you're going to write your first time, embrace the adventure of faith. Embrace the adventure of faith. Remember that verse in Hebrews 11:13, where it says they embraced the promises? I love that verse. They embraced the promises. When I go to South America in the churches... The girls kiss you on the cheek and the men give you an abrazo. You got these great big guys and they're always hugging you all the time. And I'm not very comfortable with that. I, 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 that's a little close, too close for me for a big guy to be hugging me. But they do that. But the picture here in Hebrews 11:13, they embrace the promises. And Ruth embraced the adventure of faith. It's a significant way for this book to begin. And God's providence works in such a way that each of us has plenty of opportunities to embrace a customized adventure of faith that God has designed for our lives. Ruth had her moment, and she went for it. She embraced The adventure of faith. Now, Hollywood and the world thinks that you can only have an adventure if you're an important person in an important place. Do you think anybody's going to make a James Bond movie in Middletown, Connecticut? Or Athens, Ohio? Or an Indiana Jones movie? No. The, in Hollywood's eyes, you know, can only be in exotic places and an important person to have an adventure. So they're not going to make it in Athens, Ohio, 20,000 people in the middle of Appalachia, right? It's not going to happen. But God can give us an adventure wherever we are in His world. This whole world is a Bethlehem. This is the world Jesus came to. This planet. And God has an adventure of faith for us to embrace. And you don't have to be in big places to have a big adventure. And the Hollywood adventures are not the real adventures. Those are pseudo-adventures. The real adventures are adventures of faith. And Elimelech had his opportunity to embrace the adventure of faith And he choked. He escaped it by running to Moab. He put the financial over the spiritual, didn't he? And God gave him his opportunity, and he he escaped the adventure of faith that God had for him. It's ironic, his name is God as King, but he wasn't living like that. Now, it says there was famine in the land. Now, famines in the land in the days of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were one thing. But famines after the Palestinian covenant were another thing. You go to the book of Deuteronomy 11, 13 and 14, and verse 17, and Leviticus 26, 3 and 4, and verse 20. The only reason you'd have famine in the land after they occupied the land was one reason. What was it? Sin. 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 Otherwise, you'd have plenty of rainfall. So it's obvious sin is involved, and God is disciplining the nation, and Bethlehem is involved in that. 
Uh, One Old Testament scholar said the fertility of the land functions as a spiritual thermometer of the relationship between Israel and God. And that's certainly right. So the relationship was bad. Sin was going on. And Elimelech had the opportunity of an adventure of faith by doing what? Staying right where he was when things were hard. Sometimes when things are hard, we want to escape that. Rather than embrace it by faith as an assignment from God. So he just pushed the eject button. And boy did God rebuke that, right? Boaz made it by staying in Bethlehem. That showed that Elimelech could have. Naomi later admits that God corrected the family because of that move. And the big objection is Ruth put the spiritual above the financial and did the thing that he should have done. Matthew Henry said if all should do as as Limelech did, Canaan would have been dispopulated. So he was putting himself and his family and his finances first. And he escaped the adventure by doing that. Naomi experienced the adventure of faith, but not because she embraced it. She was along for the ride. She didn't lead that parade, but she was along. It was an unwilling experience. She had to live with the poor decisions of her husband, and that brought her to an adventure of faith that she wasn't looking for. But it was there. Now, Orpah evades the adventure of faith. Like a boxer evades a punch or ducks and sidesteps. And she had her opportunity. I know you know this passage, right? Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. She kissed her goodbye, went back to her people and back to her gods. And Orpah was afraid it was going to be too hard. Have you ever thought about this? There were two redeemers in Bethlehem, Boaz and such a one. If you're into counterfactuals, it's a theological, philosophical term, you kind of wonder, what would have happened if Orpah had gone? Would there have been a husband for her? Have you ever thought about it? Maybe such a one would have been interested in Orpah. (laughs) I don't know. He wasn't interested in Ruth. But she evaded the adventure of faith, and she went back. And we don't know what happened to her, right? The Bible doesn't criticize her, but back she went to her people and her gods. By the way, we know a very famous person called Orpah today, Orpah Winfrey. No, that's her name. Her name is Orpah Her older sister couldn't say Orpah. She said Oprah. And so her name was originally Orpah, and everybody calls her Oprah. But if the original Orpah became as rich as the present-day Orpah, she still lost out big time, didn't she? She evaded the adventure of faith. But Ruth embraced it. Ruth Embraced it. Unreserved commitment. Talk about seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and trusting that all other things will be added. This statement here in verse 15 where Naomi says, Your sister's gone back to her people and her gods. Return thou after your sister-in-law. Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or turn away from following thee. For where you go, I'll go. Where you lodge, I'll lodge. Your people be my people. Your God, my God. Where you die, will I die? And there will I be buried. And the Lord do so to me and more if anything but death. Part me and thee. And that shut Naomi up. What are you going to say to that? And I have to ask ourselves this question, what do we think life's for? Is life a monopoly game? He that makes the most money wins? Is that what life is? Is life a talent contest? 
his life to fare sumptuously every day. I'll tell you what life is for. It's had the opportunity to embrace the adventure of faith. But not everybody does. Many avoid it. And here's God. He's got an adventure and people won't, won't, they won't go. Ruth embraced the adventure of faith. I just read the Jewish Publication Society commentary on Ruth that came out in 2011. It's not a Christian commentary. It's written by Jews. It's on the Hebrew text. But they said of this, there is no more radical decision in all the memories of Israel. Naomi is silenced by it. Stunning decision. Do you know nowhere in the Bible does it say Ruth was beautiful? She may have been. The Bible doesn't say that. It often says women are beautiful, right? Rachel and Rebecca and Sarah. But it doesn't say, we always assume she's a really good looking woman, right? Well, she is spiritually, right? This is attractive. I don't know what she was like physically, but I'll tell you, this is she she realized life is too short to play it safe. And she embraced the adventure of faith. As far as she knew, she's going to be on welfare the rest of her life, taking care of an old woman on welfare with no husband and no future unless God worked. In 1980, as a single pastor, I asked one of my congregation members to marry me. I was making $800 a month and living in a ramshackle one-bedroom apartment with no carpet in the living room, just the pad. A 22-year-old gal that I asked to marry me answered me with Ruth chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. She came from an upper middle class family who to this day thinks she's nuts. But I thank God that she was willing to embrace the adventure of faith that she knew was not going to be easy. And we've had an adventure. Each of us have an opportunity to do this. Sometimes more than one. There are several adventures God has for us. And Ruth had the opportunity and she embraced it. The King is coming. The King is coming. In light of the fact the King is coming... How are you going to live? Are you going to escape the adventure of faith? Are you going to play it safe? Are you going to evade it? Are you going to experience it whether you want it or not? Or are you going to embrace it? Number two. This is one more time you need to write. We need to exhibit the winsomeness of of godliness we need to exhibit the winsomeness of godliness if you just take chapter 1 and think through this chapter and think through Naomi no doubt in my mind that she exhibited a godly life and her life is a catalyst of all the other events that transpire And I believe if we had more believers like Naomi, we'd have more believers like Ruth. The Bible says it's from faith to faith. And one of the reasons I believe Naomi was a godly woman, even if she had her struggles, was the Bible says it's when we abide in Christ, we bear fruit. I became a Christian when I was 13. I didn't really live for the Lord until I was 21. I tried to witness them. My high school years, college years. How many people do you think I won to the Lord in those years? 
Zero. Not one. Not one. Why should people come to my Lord? I wasn't manifesting Him in any way. And all of God's instruments are flawed. Like Jonah and like me. But having said that, it's those that are spending time with the Lord, even with their flaws, that are attractive to others. So they ask the reason of the hope that's in you. The Jewish sages credit Naomi with converting Ruth. And I believe that they're right. Naomi speaks 12 times in this book, and her words, reactions, observations, and exclamations are windows into her soul. Someone said, real faith can always be measured by its loving fruit. And Ruth, who came to faith in Naomi, Naomi's God must have learned from Naomi the real reality of faith by experiencing its benefits in her mother-in-law's love for her. I know Naomi says some strange stuff, and I'm trying to work on that a little bit, but I want you to say, think about this. Naomi's always in touch with God in everything that happens to her. She's always bringing God in. In Naomi's worldview, she's not subject to fate or chance, but to the sovereignty of God. She lived in His presence. And she says some things that we wonder about, but she consistently sees God in all that transpires in her life. It's kind of like Joseph that way. Look, look and watch her. When she talks, she's talking about God all the time. Look in chapter 1, verse 8. Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother-in-law's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and me. And the Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. And in verse 13, would you tarry for them till they're grown? Would you refrain from marrying? Nay, my daughters, it grieves me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. You see the same thing in 20 and 21. Naomi was always talking about God. I get the shock of my life one time. I asked this lady that was married to this man for 13 years, and I said, what religion was he? She's not not a Christian. She said, we never talked about those things. Married someone 13 years, didn't have one conversation about spiritual things. Naomi was someone who was constantly thinking about the Lord, and her her life was a life from where the Lord was involved in good and, and hard things that came. Now, what about these statements that she makes in uh, some of these verses and telling them to go back and all of that? Some of that, no doubt, had some uh, infirmity in it. But remember, even Jesus said in Matthew 8, 18 and 20, Foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has not walked to lay his head. So Naomi wasn't going to have them follow her as young people and and not realize the consequences of following her. In that, she is being Christ-like. And I think in that, she's being someone that we can see she has a lot of integrity. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3. Pastor Parsons and Pastor Matt and I were talking at breakfast this morning about prayer meetings and contrasting some of the prayers and prayer meetings with the prayers of the apostles. Chapter 3 in Ephesians is one of those great prayers of Paul's. And he says in verse 16, I want verse, go down to 19. 
He's praying that He would grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, length, depth, and height, and to know the love of Christ that passes knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. That's almost a heretical statement, isn't it? He just borders on it. It's not heretical the way he means it, but I'm saying he just he's stretching everything, right? That we might be filled with all the fullness of God. That in Christians, others might see Christ. And the winsomeness of godliness is a Christ-like holiness, not a Pharisaical holiness that drives people away. Have you ever met Christians like that, where they're grumpy and they're sour and they're mean, and somehow they think they're a witness, so that somebody says, well, "I want to be a, I want to be like you. <laughs> I can't wait to be like you. I want to spend eternity with people like you." There is a godliness that's repulsive. It's a false godliness, a Pharisaical godliness. God, I thank you I'm not as other men. Jonah had some of that, and God had to deal with him on it, didn't he? But there's a godliness that is a a genuine thing that's a magnet, not to us, but to God. Paul wanted that for these folks. He wanted it for himself. Turn over to Philippians chapter chapter 1. And verse 19. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I'll be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ may be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. That was his prayer for him. He wanted people to pray for that for him. Because he knew without that he wasn't going to be effective. Now critical to Ruth's attraction to Naomi was her attraction to Naomi's God. Turn back to Ruth chapter 1 with me real quick. And even when Naomi is at her lowest, she's bringing God in. And she has the courage to say, the Lord, watch what she says when she gets back to Bethlehem. Verse 20, she said to them, call me not Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. She did not say she was bitter. She said what? The Lord has dealt bitterly with me. There's a difference. Job says something very similar. And she realized that the Lord was correcting her. And she was public about that. She was public about the correction her family had received. In the correction, she saw the sin. And she didn't hide it. She wasn't pretending that things were better than they were. And she said, I went out full, and the Lord's brought me home again empty. Why call me Naomi, seeing the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? Thank God for Christians that aren't pretending they're better than they are. And who allow God to correct them. And are honest enough to be open and transparent. And that's what she was. There's something beautiful about that. And so I I have a high view of her, and I believe it was her, the godliness of her life, that drew Naomi to the Lord. I had two pastors in my life. I was telling some of the men here that. 
I grew up in a New Evangelical American Baptist Church, so I know New Evangelicalism inside and out. I grew up in it. We didn't have a we didn't have a clue about discernment. I didn't get any discernment there at all. Part of it was my fault, but part of it was the church's fault. I, I said our pastor loved Billy Graham, and he looked like Billy Graham, and he <laughs> he believed like Billy Graham, and so we. But he was, but he had, he had, he, he certainly was flawed. But I will say this, he did exhibit the winsomeness of godliness. He was a lovely man. He just had a blind spot on discernment, and it was a serious blind spot. Not to be excused in any way. The other pastor that was in my life was a fundamentalist, and I got my discernment under his teaching, and that was a hard run for me. Uh, and I'm thankful that God brought him into my life. He embraced the adventure of faith. He would reach out and do radical things that other people thought were crazy. One of them was start the church in Athens. Other Bible, past, Bible church pastors said, You're not going to Athens and try to start a Bible church, are you? Do you know what kind of city that is? He did know. Ohio University, for years, has been the number one party school in America. We just got bumped from that one, from that distinction. We're now number two. Once in a while we get bumped. We're either number one or number two. But other pastors said, you're not going to that city and start a church. But that pastor embraced the adventure of faith so that he was willing to start a Bible-believing, fundamental, separated church in a place like Athens, Ohio, and many other places. I thank God for those in my past. Both were flawed instruments, as all of us are. But by having those in my past, God used them both mightily in my life. Now, as we bring this to a landing this, this afternoon, let's ask ourselves some questions. God has a customized adventure of faith for you to embrace. The king is coming. He's commissioned us as churches to call out a people for his name be involved in that program the king is coming we have an opportunity to embrace the adventure of faith have we embraced it or are we trying to escape it or are we evading it Is God calling you to do something that other people think is way out? What do you think Ruth's family thought of that decision? God expects us to do things other people think are radical. God expects us to do things that are radical. That's the adventure. And Ruth embraced the adventure of faith. Naomi exhibited the winsomeness of godliness. Life was hard. Life got harder. She wasn't perfect in it, and that's discouraging, isn't it, when we fail? It's always a temptation to give up. I've already messed up, what's the point? But in her hardest moments, and we're not seeing her at her best in one sense, but in another sense we are. Ruth observed her with the death of her husband, and then the death of her two sons. And those hard moments were moments when God was working to use that family and to use those moments to have her exhibit the faith that was in her heart to those who didn't have it. 
my wife's family are not Christians. Her dad and mom are divorced. During her surgery, we had opportunities to talk to both of them that we've never had in 36 years. God uses the hard times of life. He puts us on display. He puts the spotlight on His people. And He's bringing them into those moments where the lost have opportunity to see what He's done in their life. To face the hard realities of a fallen world. Jesus is coming. Am I embracing the adventure of faith? Am I exhibiting the winsomeness of godliness? Are others embracing the adventure of faith because of me? Father, as we come into your presence this afternoon, we ask that the Spirit of God would search all of our hearts about any evasions or escape mechanisms that we are operating under. We don't have to be Hollywood people, be in big cities and big places. Sometimes the adventure of faith is staying in a hard place, in a little place, going to a place where others would not go or think of going. Help us, Lord, to not miss our opportunities. And when we failed, may we not let that stop us